You are listening to the LWDG Pod Dog with me, Joanne Parrott. I am the founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group. Every single week, I will be talking with our community about how you can improve your relationship with your dog and with a community of women just like you. Don't forget that you can win some prizes every single week with our giveaway. All you need to do to be in with a chance of winning is take a picture of yourself listening to this episode of the podcast, share it on your Instagram stories and tag us at the Ladies Working Dog Group. And if you want to, share your biggest takeaway from this episode with us too, because we'd love to hear what you think. Every single week we go through and we pick a winner and someone wins something exciting from our shop. So definitely get involved if you want to win something. But for now, enjoy this episode. You can do this and we are here to show you how. So let's get started. This week I get to speak to the amazing Michelle Osman all about how she became a dog trainer but doesn't class herself as a dog trainer. What got you into working with dogs? Um, having dogs myself, I'd had horses. I'd understood a lot from the horse world um, about how we trained horses. We spent a lot of time understanding the, the paces of horses. We were doing a lot of chiropractic with horses ages before we were doing things with dogs. What got me into training dogs and training people was as I lived in the Cotswolds at the time, more and more people were moving out of cities into the country. So when they arrived into the country, they had to buy their defender, their hunter's wellies and their gun dog. Um, they had no idea what they were doing with them. They were going to more traditional types of trainers in village halls. Nothing wrong with that. Not looking that. That's fine. But they had bought probably some of the most beautiful gun dogs in the world off of keepers, off of traditional gun dog people. And the modern, the, the old school sort of village hall training wasn't working for them. And I was out with my dogs. I lived in a small village in the Cotswolds. I sort of totted around. People got to know me with my dogs. I'd walk across the fields with six or seven spaniels roughly at heel. When I say roughly, I mean, with just in the field with me was good some days. Um, and people started to say to me, oh, I wish I could do that with my dog. I wish I could do that. And I found myself starting to give advice to people. And then a friend of mine said, you really should do this. You, know, you really should do this almost as a living. Um, and because I worked with horses for a long time as well, I understood and, and trained people on horses. I understood a lot about animals and people and how you get those two to work. And, and I started giving lessons and um, just just to sort of small individual lessons. Um, and they started getting more and more requests for it because so-and-so came to me, Laura came to me with her Labrador. And then Laura was at the school date, sat with her dog beautifully at um, 16 weeks old, just sat watching the kids going into school because that's a good exercise. I think it's brilliant for a dog just to sit calmly. And, and another mother came and said, oh, my God, I wish our puppy did that. And she gave my details to the other mother. So I am a product of mothers. I am the woman that got pushed around the school. My cards got pushed around the school gates. But that was important to me because that's the type of dog that I could see was becoming more and more popular. Um, and when I started seeing more and more cocker spaniels about the school gates, I knew I had to up my game and start doing more lessons because understanding cocker spaniels, um, you know, once the royals announced that they had cocker spaniels, that was it. Everybody had to have a cocker spaniel. Um, <laughs> And they are pretty, pretty unique breed. They are the most manipulative breed of dog I've ever, ever known. Um, and so I, I felt that I had to help people. It was out of, born out of frustration of watching other people's failure, I think. I loved your, pro, uh, your proposed podcast title, Dog Trainer, Who Me. So tell me a little bit more about why you want to talk about that subject. Well, I don't think of myself as a dog trainer. I think of myself as a people trainer. I spend all my time training and educating people about dogs, not just um, their own dogs, but other dogs, other breeds, their breed, what they want to do with it. And I've always been um, a people person. You know, my corporate career was very much about people um, running a large technology company. And it was about the fact that I had to work with various different people of different abilities and, and different ilks. And when I started thinking about it with people and I started then getting more and more into the dog training, having had horses for years and ridden horses and trained horses and everything, it became really obvious to me that if you can get yourself aligned with the people, you've got more chance of them being able to help them train their dog. 
I know some fantastic dog people. I mean, oh, I watch them with dogs and they're amazing. I wouldn't let them go and see my grandmother for Sunday lunch. They've got absolutely no social skills at all. And I certainly wouldn't expect them to be able to translate what they do into words that the general public would understand and be able to do. What you're saying there is sort of, I completely resonate with what you're saying because um, my dad trained me to begin with. um, And my father was fantastic with dogs, but he couldn't explain to me. So I would ask him why we were doing something away and he'd say, that's the way we do it. And I'm like, yeah, but, but why? Even to this day, I want to be as good as he was. But it was very frustrating because I couldn't work out how he'd go there. Does that make sense? So I completely yeah. understand what you mean. It's like, it's not the ability to train the dog, but it's the ability to train the person holding the lead yeah. to train the dog. Yeah, and it's it's that why question. Why is, the, you know, children answer, ask it constantly and it drives us mad. Why? Why are we doing this? Why are you doing that? What are you doing that for? We should ask it much more of people. And when I see people go to dog trainers and they come back and they say, I said, well, what did you do? And they said, we did this, this and this. And I said, why did they do that? Well, I don't know why. We we, we just did that. We were told to give a treat at that point. And if they don't understand the why and what's behind it, when, because a dog is not a robot and it will throw a curveball at you, something happens, they can't unpick the knitting to find out where the problem was. And that's the thing where your father was with you. He probably never had to admit the picking because he used a set process and his dogs were the way his dogs were. And we'll talk about that in a minute, about the way they've changed. But you, if you gave your dad a modern dog now, he'd probably stand there for, to begin with and go, I haven't got a clue why this dog's behaving like this. And his processes may not work because yeah. he never really understood the why because he never had to. Yeah, and, and sort of talking about that, when you say about how the modern breed lines differ from the older lines, there was a definite distinction with when Dad first started out with the Spaniels, the lines he went for. And then as the years went on and he brought in what I would class or what he would have classed as softer lines, yeah, he found them heavily frustrating. You know, one dog I had, Jess, was because she was so soft. Dad was like, I've bought her, I can do nothing with her. You have her. And he really just couldn't do that. So when you talk about how they've changed, how have they changed for you? Um, That's a classic. Dogs were a lot harder is a word I would use, which probably isn't fair. Um, We tended to keep our dogs differently then. So somebody like your dad, he wouldn't have had, he loved his dogs, but he wouldn't have had them all in the house. They wouldn't have been part of the family. They would have lived out in kennels. They would have come out and they would have worked for him. And he wanted these traits. He wanted a hard hunting. He wanted a dog that went into cover, came out covered in blood, didn't matter. It worked. It wanted it, whatever. That dog could not live in the house with you because it just couldn't live with you because it could not control itself enough because it was that hard. But that's what your dad wanted. Um, And that's what an awful lot of the older lines were like. Things like the training methods were a lot harder then. We, you know, we don't need to go into detail, but everybody knows there were a lot of different techniques then that nowadays we're just going, God, that's awful. Why did we do that? But that's the way they did it. And it worked with the dogs. Well, the classics was the fact that your dad probably never touched a young dog. He probably left it till it was nine, ten months old before he started doing training with it. And that's because by the time a dog's nine or ten months old, it can take a telling off. And unfortunately, a lot of the older methods of training were based on telling off. You either got it right or you got a whatever, you know, and dogs could take that. Whereas if you did that with a a nine or 10 week old puppy or even a three month old puppy, it would just shut down on you, whether it was hard or not. So I've seen an awful lot change in what we've wanted in dogs because we've, we've changed them. You know, your dad wanted a dog for a specific job. Um, If he wanted a dog that was a guarding dog and a, and a, herding dog a collie dog say those would have been the really strong traits in the dog nowadays people want collies to live in the house with them if you had young children with a guarding dog with a strong herding trait it would be a nightmare wouldn't it you know if they'd be herding them and guarding them it'd be terrible nobody could come in the house and don't get me wrong I get clients that come with those breeds because they bought from farm dogs that have still got that old school breeding in them so 
I think what we've done is we have changed, and as you use the term softer, we soften dogs. The way I think about it is imagine all the traits of a dog are like buttons on um, a rack. And if you wanted a hard hunting spaniel, you'd have hunting turned up to 11. If you wanted a Labrador that just toddled around the house, you'd have that hunting turned down to two. Um, If you wanted a lovable, affordable, nice family pet, you'd have companionability turned up to 11. But your dad didn't want that, so he'd have that turned down to two. Does that make sense, all the different traits? Yeah, absolutely. And like I, I, I feel like you've almost met him somewhat. You knew when dad was losing his temper because his hat would come off and hit the floor. <laughs> and if he did that, the dogs knew. The dogs were like, whoa, somewhere we went wrong there. But I think there's definitely a difference, like even between generations. So I was introduced to the sport in that way. But then Jess, the bitch my dad gave to me, came to live in my house. And she was my friend and she sat on the, on the sofa with me and all those types of things. So, yeah, I can definitely see. And I see it across our group. The, the change has gone from we almost want the both of the best of both worlds. We want a dog that can go out and hunt hard and make us proud on the field but then we come home and sit down with us and and watch a little bit of you know tv it's it's quite a a challenging role and it is you know i talk about arga gun dog suspenders um you know the dog that can sit in front of the arga for six days a week and then go out and be a working gun dog but the rest of the time it's a family pet um you know there, there are so many different types of that um people want dogs that can be a family member and then go out and do agility i call them utility dogs and you know we want dogs that could be multiple players we ask a lot of them when we ask them to do all that um yeah. and you know that's what i think has really changed because if you go back to some of the more um trialing people and you look at some of the top trialers the lines they've got still are those hard hunting lines because anybody that's been to a trial I know you've seen some yourself that's what they do they get the dog out they work it for 15 minutes and it has to shine they don't care that it doesn't know how to cuddle they don't care that it can't really walk on the lead because their job is to do a specific job for 15 minutes and promote the skill set of that breed in the hunting field now those dogs are still quite hard and tough. And, you know, I have seen and I have had clients come to me where they've had dogs from those lines and they've brought them into the home as a pet dog and they've got horrendous problems because that dog's got that. So quite rightly, as you say, the softer side of it has been bred into the dogs. We know that many years ago we split some breeds into working lines and show lines. Yeah. And that's when we definitely decided to change the characteristics. You know, for a show dog, you just want something that just stands there, walks nicely. We don't want anything that's really doing what I think it should be doing in its real sense, I'm afraid to say. Um, But we split that and we deliberately bred two lines of dogs. We bred the show dogs and we bred the working dogs. I actually believe that now we have split the working dogs down even further. And I think we are now breeding your pet working dog we are breeding your field working dog and then we're breeding your trial working dog does that make sense absolutely I completely agree with you you know my daughter used to be part of the young kennel club and we had a show lab at one point because she wanted to show everything that we had was spaniel with a dark tail we weren't allowed in a ring anywhere in the the country so we bought her the show lab and it was just it was a world apart from a working lab it was it was big it was cumbersome it it didn't have any drive in it you know it it just wasn't anything in fact you could go as far as saying even though they sh- share the same pedigree they are breeds apart aren't they? Yeah, they they are they are different breeds they are different breed lines and the first thing I ask people when they book a lesson with this I've got a, a Labrador I say is it from working lines or is it from show lines and they go pardon it's a yeah. Labrador. No, well, where did you buy it from? <laughs> and because if they bought a working line one, admittedly, a lot of the um, working lines now are a lot softer in Labradors, but it will have different traits than if they bought a show one. And you know, yeah. when people say I've got a chocolate working dog, there's only a few of those in the country. Yeah, yeah. and I definitely even think, like, looking at the breed, the dogs are. You know, a working lab looks so different to a show lab. It, it's yeah. quite shocking. They don't look again. They don't look like the same dog. So we're talking there about how 
dogs have changed. How do you think, you know, dogs and trainers and the relationship between them has, tra- has changed over the last sort of 20 years? Well, I think that um, what people want from dogs has changed. We talk, covered that briefly, but, you know, people want a family pet. Um, in our world, they want a family pet that can also go out shooting. Very few people now, because of dog fest, want to kennel their dogs, so they need a dog that can live in the house. Um, many years ago, I'm old enough to remember Barbara Woodhouse, I'm afraid to say, um, you know, your dog trainer was quite a strict person. They had a set way of training. Um, they could deviate from that set. It was usually done in a village hall, which if you're going to walk your dog in a village hall all its life, that's perfect. But it was never in the real world. And I think people now are taking their dogs. They are wanting more from their dogs, expecting more from their dogs. And I think the training worlds have to step up to that. So as a companion and gun dog trainer, I also have to understand about agility, hoopers, um, canny cross, all these different things, because people are going to come to me and they're going to want to do that with their dog. Just because, and especially if they've got a spaniel and things like that, because they're all, the spaniels are great for agility, especially little cockers, whizzy little cockers, um, and also for running dogs and things like that. So as a trainer, I've got to understand what the end goal is for these people and help them to put the basics in. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe the basic training for every dog is the same, whether you are going to have it as a fluffy bunny pet, family pet with lots of young children around it hanging off its ears, or a hard hunting dog, or a guard dog, or a a competition dog doing agility. The basics are still the same. That dog's going to live with you, and it's got to have some, some manners in society, and it's got to live in your house. It's got to understand the basics. And also, the, the one thing I would say about dogs, if you rode a horse, and you'd never ridden a horse before, and so you, Joe, decided you wanted to go and to learn to ride, and you went to your local riding school, they would not put you on a novice horse. They would put you on a schoolmaster that knew exactly what you were going to do, put up with all your mistakes, still performed, and you would learn from the horse. Dogs and humans together in dog training is about the only time you put a novice animal with a novice person and ask them to get it right. And that's massively frustrating. I come from a, a horse background, and you're quite right. My first six ponies were push-button ponies. Point yeah. the fence, they went over, made me look fab, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, <laughs> But then I'm sure the, you did. <laughs> no, I really didn't. The minute I went on something that was a little bit uh, tasty, I, I sort of went, can I have my push button bag? <laughs> but you are absolutely right in the fact that in the horse world, it is not blinked at. If you outgrow a pony, you need to sell it on. You need to get a different type of pony. You want to do dressage, you get a dressage pony. Nobody says anything. But in the dog world, that sort of flexibility of a working animal that hasn't come with it. So you do end up with the fact that most dogs stay with people for life. So there aren't those schoolmasters around that you can buy who can train you as a novice handler. So novice starts with novice. And literally, for like you said, from the outset, it is absolute chaos. This is why um, I've, I've got six dogs of my own now um, here. I'm down to six from 12 or whatever it was. Um And I will use my dogs in lessons to let people do things with them. So if somebody wants to learn to walk their dog to heel, I will give them one of my dogs on a loose lead and say, take that for a walk. This is the command. This is the button to push. Because if you don't know what a dog feels like when it's walking loosely, perfectly to heel, how can you ever train a dog to do that? Yeah. Or I will let them do a retrieve with my dog and handle it. Now, my dogs are you. It's good for my dogs to be handled by other people. Um, it shows that the training's in there not just for me a couple of my boys are a little bit mummy's boys and will look at me going why is that person telling me that but they'll do it Um, but I think it's really important that people get the opportunity to try before they buy yeah they get that feeling that's great and I agree with you as well that it's about understanding what their end goal is because you could waste a lot of time and a lot of frustration on energy on training something into your dog or yourself to understand it that you're never going to use and, and that's just exhausting for everybody. Everybody who begins wants the same thing. A dog that recalls, a dog that's got steadiness, and a dog that walks to heel. Whether you're a pet owner, a competition, working dog, whatever, that's what you want. If everybody had a dog that did that, we'd have a far better society. 
we'd have a far calmer group because if you look across our group, the, the biggest our frustrations are around those things, you know, yeah. they it is the, that ability to have a calm dog that can one minute be out in the field training with you and then can come in the house and, and sit on the sofa while the family eats. It's just yeah. having that steadiness in the dog. And also the, the dog, I, I'm very careful when I use the word respect because it means different things to different people. But I was always brought up that you, you even with the horses and the dogs, the dog's got to respect you. That doesn't mean you have to be its leader, no. but it does have to know that when you say, please stand there, um, and I think, again, with horses, you learn a bit more because if they don't do what they're told, you're going to come across that. You're going to get hurt. So when you say stand up, you mean stand up. And when you say sit down, you mean sit down. I suppose in our rush to get to a, a different type of knowledge from the traditional trainer to whatever we're going to call this new trainer, because there's about 500 names, force free, oh. positive. I, I'm lost with it all and I work in it every day. We've we've lost the understanding that whatever we call it, whatever we do, when we tell the dog to stop, it has to stop for its own safety and for the safety of those around it. Yeah, I, I have a similar issue with you with the term force free. Yeah. Um, force free has come into the dog training world because people don't like the idea that they might have to be harsh with their dog. That isn't the case. There's no point picking a fight with a dog. You're never going to win it. Because it might do what you want it to do out of fear to the first time or the second time. But the third time, as soon as it gets some space, it's going to run away and never come back to you. So that's, yeah. it. that's dogs. So the trouble with me for force free is if I ask my dog to make choices constantly, um, this is what force free is about. In my understanding of force free, is you're going to ask yeah. the dog to choose to do things. I have knowledge that that dog does not have. I know there's a main road over there and that dog's on that, that pheasant and it's on a runner. I know that if I don't blow that stop whistle and my dog does not stop, it is going to be squished. It's that yeah. simple. That dog does not know that. That dog's choice it's making is there's a runner. I've been changed to chase runners. I'm going after it. That dog can't, hasn't got the chance to make a choice. So it has to respect, and I like that word. That's the word I use a lot. I expect my dogs to respect me. I respect my dogs. They're, I understand my dog. When it's telling me there's a bird in there, I trust that dog. If it pulls out of the air, I've asked it to hunt him um, on a runner, and it carries on and brings that bird back, I respect that dog. I trust it. So I expect it back from my dog. My concern is about people having this whole idea that you can train by never having to put the dog right the yeah. dog does not always know best and and that is my concern but people will go to force free trainers because they've been sold in my mind they've been sold this fluffy bunny type of training and it'll you know everything could be wonderful dogs don't work like that dogs need to understand there are boundaries to me every dog is like a toddler a two and a half year old you've got children yeah when you're two and a half year old was running around in the wood would you have let her out of your sight no no would you have let her go too far? No. No. Would you have expected her to stop when you shouted stop because she was about to run through an open gateway? Yes. Absolutely. That's how I treat my dogs. I treat my dogs whether they are eight weeks old or I've got a 14-year-old beagle behind me asleep on the floor snoring. Whether you're a 14-year-old beagle, I treat them as if they're a toddler. Now, I very much believe that, as you say, we have got so confused with what training is. There's so much terminology out there. You know, I, I'm apparently a um, reward-based behavioural positive trainer. What does all that mean? What does it mean? Does it mean I teach whales to jump through boots for sardines? I don't know. <laughs> no, what it means is I train dogs' habits. I'm positive. I try and keep it positive. I use reward, be that treats, be that food, be that um, cuddles, whatever, or allowed to have the ball or whatever. They, those are the rewards I use. But the main thing I use is common sense and respect. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what keeps it positive. To hear you say, you know, the amount of labels that, that have been applied to your way of training, it, that just shows the so to the length of, of, of madness we live in and the fact that there's not even a terminology. We reference back to the horse world. They are a riding instructor. But I suppose well, you had your quite... BH, BHSAIs, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. That but was just... assistant instructor and then BHSIs and you knew what they were. I mean, but we also, I think, in the equine world, you are the 
indication has been made that the person is training the, the rider, not the horse. Yes. And again, I think that hasn't really happened in the dog industry. We still, like you say, dog trainers. You don't think of yourself as a dog trainer. You're a person trainer. For you and, and what you do and what you do very successfully, if I was to come to you with a, an, you know, a, a 12-week-old pup and I say, right, it's, I'm, it's, I'm new to this, they're new to this, how, how do you work to make it simple for them? First thing is I ask about the person. So it goes back to my old uh, people management skills. I under, start to understand the person. I'll talk about what their job is, what their family setup is, because that dog has to fit into all that. So if you happen to be, I don't know, you were a project manager, a very good project manager, you'll be very analytical, you'll be very organised, you'll be very methodical. So I know that when I want to talk to you about something to do with your dog, I need to put it into analytical uh, project management types of terms. If you are somebody who is a, I don't know, a mother with four children, young children, you live in chaos constantly, <laughs> you know you do. Um, there's a very strong chance if you're not careful, your dog will become part of that chaos. So I will talk to them about the home environment first. It's all about getting everything right. The last component I bring into it is the dog. Because the, the dog's just got to pop in somewhere and fit into all this. If everything's surrounding that dog and its lifestyle and it's, it's, it's not right, then the training won't happen. Because I always say to people, training is not something you go and do for an hour a day. Training is a lifestyle. When your dog lives in your house, it arrives at eight weeks and it starts training you. It starts training you because it's got a set of predetermined um, behaviours in it as a dog. So I'll say to people, before you had your dog, so it's a 12-week-old puppy now, can you remember what your morning routine was? And they'll say, oh, yeah, we used to have a cup of tea in bed. I said, tell me about your morning routine now. Well, oh, we've got to get up to get the dog out. We've got to get the dog out in case it has a wee. I'm going to see how that dog's already started training you. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's talking to people about how they've already let the dog train them. And we talk about what they want to train in the dog. So you're here with your 12-week-old pup. And we've worked out who you are and what you are. And that you've got a relatively good understanding of dogs. So then I'll explain to them that I have a, a set way of training dogs, but every dog and handler combination is unique. So even though I train my dogs a certain way, every dog I've had with me is a new, unique new combination. So it's not always going to work the same. So the trick is to have as many tools in your toolbox as possible. So I've probably got a dozen different games, as I call them, that I can play with my dogs to teach heel work. But I might only need to use one or two with them, but I might need to use all 12 or, you know, so it's about understanding that and getting the people to understand that they're a unique proposition. And what's about to happen is unique to them and that dog. And then I'll sit down with you and I'll say, so what do you want? And you'll tell me that oh, I want my dog to go shooting. Right? OK. Have you ever shot yourself or been to the shooting world? No. Well, do you think you probably need to go and see what the world is like for your dog before you go into it? Because that's very common. And you must get yeah, that a lot yeah. with a lot of novice handlers. They've never actually been on a shoe. Um, and they don't understand the difference between driven, walk up, picking up, beating. So, you know, I have had taken clients with me on shoot days to introduce them to the world. So I think the more we can get in there, the more chance we've got of things working out for the dog. So once I understand, they talk to me about that and we discover they can't actually do that and what they really want is a nice pet gun dog that they can show off to their mates with. We, we, we've got that established. So we always go back to the first thing. Well, the first thing is you want recall, you want walking to hill and you want sit, which is steadiness. So I would spend the first lesson teaching you the basics of those three. Any of you that comes for lessons from me um, a set homework. You'd be sent away. That homework would have um, handouts. You get sent an email with a handout about everything we talked about in the lesson. And I would then tell you to go away until you'd learnt all of that or were having problems with it. Because I can't move forward with you and your 12-week-old puppy until you've learnt that basic. Yeah. And the other thing I talk about is overstimulation and calmness. Everybody wants their dogs to do lots. They don't need to. Dogs just want us to go to work for eight hours so they can sleep. <laughs> and, you know, people are going, well, what should I be doing? And people turn up with their daily schedules. I'll talk about their daily schedules for their dogs. 
And you know, it's almost like an eight-year-old. It's got gym in the morning. It's got swimming in the afternoon. It's doing this. And I'm just like, whoa, this is a puppy. It needs to sleep for 22 hours a day. Um, and that's how it develops. I will talk a lot about what the stage of their dog is at. So at 12 weeks, it only has the cognitive ability to do this. One day it will be able to do it. The next day it's like a goldfish and it's forgotten it. So we'll talk through all that. I will take them through the first six months of their dog and what's going to happen to it physically, emotionally and training wise. And then they usually leave the lesson looking like they've been through a punch bag with me uh, with this little tired dog in tow um, and start putting it into practice. And I really you know, quite often say to people, I don't want to see you for three or four months. I don't believe that people should come to weekly lessons. I don't do courses because how you could train your dog in, a, you could get it to walk to hill in a week because you're experienced, blah, blah, blah. You could bring your friend with you with the sibling, the little sister of that dog. And because she's never trained a dog before, it could take her three months. But she would feel very intimidated if she's worked, turned up the second week with you. There you were with a lovely dog walking to hill and hers was still yanking around everywhere and yapping and jumping up. So. I always go back to the fact it's about the individual connection of the dog and the handler and understanding. Does all that make sense? Absolutely. I can almost see somewhere, some ways where the traditional ways have, have come from. Over, over hundreds of years, it worked. And I think a lot of what we do now, we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater a little bit. We're throwing yeah, I... everything away. And there's a lot of good in there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And this comes back to the whole thing I talk about, about overstimulation and calmness. The reason your the kennel dogs were kenneled was because they shut away. They just went to sleep. They switched off. As soon as the door opened, they were so keen to see you. They was, they'd get on and do the job. Um, now, that's not the way a lot of people want to do it. And also with dog fests here, you know, you've got to be really careful of these things. But if people did the same within their house. So when I have a young puppy, so they're crated. And they're created in a different room to everybody else. So I create almost an indoor kennel. And they learn to switch off there. Then they start joining the rest of the pack. And don't get me wrong, my dogs are asleep on the sofa in the lounge, in the conservatory behind me, all of them, fast asleep, five spaniels, out for the count. They're allowed on the sofas. They can do what they like. Because if I ask them to get off, they will get off. But the puppy will learn to live in that environment. And my dogs are very much have me around all the time but I'm not at their beck and call all the time and they're not annoying me all the time. And that's the bit I think that a lot of people, when they bring their dog in house, they feel that they have to entertain that dog all the time and they never get it to switch off. So as you say, there's all the licky mats, there's the um, Kongs, there's giving the dog a chew, there's every hour taking it out to the garden, there's getting it set up for hydrotherapy or swimming lessons or all these different things. And I think that if we all just chilled out a bit more with our dogs and took the fact that that dog is learning from us every moment it's with us, and as I say, training is a lifestyle, not something you do for an hour a day, I think we'd start to see reap the benefits of some of the traditional methods, as you've talked just mentioned, but we'd start to see it mixed into a modern world because society has totally changed. You know, the way we used to keep dogs, you can't do it. I grew up in a village where most of the dogs were out, were kicked out the door at eight o'clock in the morning and wandered around the village and the streets and everything and then came home at tea time with us kids. You know, you couldn't do that now, could you? <laughs> You'd end up with, your, with the, the police on your doorstep. Um, so society has changed dramatically. Um, but... And we've changed the breeding. But I think we've we've almost got to find a new way, a new balanced way of accepting the dogs into our homes, but giving them the ability to still be dogs, but live in within our human society. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Like we've done a podcast recently about, you know, the distractions that are given to dogs when they don't they don't necessarily need to be constantly distracted and stimulated all day long and if you look at our dogs if we're not in the house they sleep in their area on their bed and they're out cold and then if you open the door and you're there you sit down to watch tv they'll fall asleep straight away and they lay and play and their choice is to sleep their choice isn't to be constantly doing something they want to do what they were doing when I wasn't here, which is just have a relax. And I think what we tend to do is because we're trying to think that they need to be doing all these things all the time, 
is we encourage them to be a little bit hyper with they oh God, yeah. themselves off. We, we overstimulate. The first thing I say to people when they arrive with a young puppy that's rushing around and everything, and they'll say to me, oh, sorry, we've not taken it for its two-hour walk on the moors. I'm going, it's a 14-week-old puppy, and you're taking it out for two hours on the moors. Oh, yeah, it doesn't go very far. It stays with us. And I'm like, of course it doesn't go anywhere because it's still in its tied to you apron stringers. But what are you doing exercising a dog for two hours? Um, and that's got nothing to do with damaging their joints. That's not the conversation I'm having with them. The conversation I'm having with them is about what it's doing to that dog's mental ability to be able to cope. It's overstimulating the dog. Dogs need calm. Dogs want to be second in the pack. And I know the pack is a difficult word to use around yeah. things and the same as respect. But I'm a great believer that our dogs want to know that we're in control of everything. They just sleep. They do what we ask them to do, but they don't have to worry about anything because dogs get anxious. Some dogs that come to me that are hyperactive, they're just anxious because nobody is taking control. And I think that's part of the problem because, you know, dogs are used to a pack environment or family environment, I think is a term we now have to use. Um, so they're used to somebody, mother and father, being in charge. If mother and father aren't there and in charge, the dog's going, oh, if nobody's in charge, that might have to be me. Oh, it's a bit stressful. I might make wrong decisions. And they will make the wrong decisions. You said that yourself. They will make the wrong choices. Then they'll get told off. And then you start this whole circle of you having to tell the dog off because it's made the wrong choices. If the dog just sat in the bed quietly, none of that would be happening. He'd be happy. She'd be happy. You'd be happy. And you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. Like, if you think about it, even from a, a perspective of, of our lives, sometimes I say to my family, what do you want for dinner tonight? And I get so many looks of, I don't know, have I got to think about it? And then I say, do you want this? And they're like, oh, no, we don't want that. Right, what do you want? I don't know, I can't think about it. And I'm like, oh, and in the end, I say, this is what we are having. And they go, okay. And I'm like, my mum says to me all the time, the problem with you, Joanne, is you give them too many choices. And I was like, absolutely right. And I think that's almost gone over to our dogs and people yeah. family. What do you want to do? Well, actually, I would just rather you told me what I was going to do and we'll just do that. So whilst all this has been going on, do you think that we need to go, not full circle, but we almost need to just come back to this common sense line, don't we? Yeah, that's what it is. You know, we need to stop. I mean, social media is a big driver on this. You know, on the television, on Facebook, on Twitter, TikTok, all these things. We're seeing this, so say, perfect dog world. People with their perfect dogs. They don't exist. No dog's a robot. Take it from me. You know, I've run my dogs in competitions and it's been an absolute idiot. It's like it's never heard a whistle in its life. It's I've come away thinking, God, I should go back to disowning goldfish. You know, it's, it's just terrible feeling, but they're not robots. Things go wrong. And society's created this um, pressure on everybody all the time to have the perfect dog. They've done it with kids. You know, we, we know the issues that we're seeing coming out of human society now where the pressure's been put on it. But everybody has this, this idea of what their dog should be like or people are putting pressure on them. Nobody wants to be shamed on Facebook as the dog walker on the beach yesterday morning whose dog wouldn't come back because somebody videoed it and put it on Facebook. Nobody wants that. And I think that we just have to take it all back a bit and just go, well, what do you want from your dog? If you tell me that you never want your dog to go off the lead in public, then all you really want to do is teach it to walk to heel. You don't need to worry about recall. That's fine if you live in a city environment and your dog never gets that opportunity. If you tell me that walking to heel, your dog, you don't mind if your dog's a couple of foot ahead of you, as long as it's it's roughly with you, that's fine. If you tell me you want perfect heel work, whether your dog's nose is glued to your hip uh, or your thigh, that's your choice. If you tell me you want your dog to sit in its bed and not make a move and not make a noise when you have visitors there, that's your choice. And I think we have to start going back to allowing humans to make their choice rather than being in a situation where society is making the choice for them. I absolutely love that. And I, I can imagine the, the amount of people listening to this when it goes out live who will go, oh my God, I've waited so long for somebody to say that. Yeah. Because the pressure, 
our group formed from that pressure where people constantly felt they weren't good enough. They weren't yep. doing a good enough job. They were messing their dog up. People thinking, you know, I make one mistake and I've broken them for life. And um, we just, it is that perspective that everything is meant to be in everything in life from the color of your front door now apparently you should be painting it seven times a year to to everything that everything's meant to be the shiny perfect chocolate box life and it's just it's not it's not attainable and nor should you want it no and um you know i have clients that come to me with the old dog new tricks you know so people come to me with five-year-old spaniels i had one client in the cotswolds and um he i'm sure you won't mind me telling the story he had a four-year-old spaniel and he came to see me and he'd never ha- had anything but a pet dog it was his first pet dog um within two years he was out picking up with that dog we taught him all the skill sets we took him shooting we showed him what the world was he trained the helped train the dog and he got out there picking up and he had a great time with it um but you know previous to that he put so much pressure on himself to have the perfect house dog that when i oh pet dog sorry that when i said to him the dog was having a problem hunting because it just wouldn't go. It was scared to go. It had never been allowed to go. So I said, we need to let it go. <laughs> and, and we did. We got it hunting in the end. Um, and in the end, it was actually a very nice hunting dog. But we get all these pressures on us to create whatever we want. It doesn't matter if it takes you 10 years to train your dog. What a lovely way to spend 10 years. You cannot train a dog in under two years. That's my honest belief because of what a dog has to develop in two years. They develop in two years what we develop in 20. I wouldn't like to think any of the human beings I know in this world are really who they're starting to be until they're 20, 25 years old. So why would I expect a dog to? But there's no rush. You, there are very few things if you follow training, good training advice that you will do wrong that will mess a dog up that are irretrievable from. Yeah. And there's also this one thing I I say to people, you can sometimes fix a problem or you have to accept that the rest of your life, you will manage that problem. And sometimes once you stop trying to fix it and just manage it, do you know what? The problem goes away. Absolutely. Um, That was absolutely, that was an amazing podcast. I've absolutely loved talking to you about those things. If people want to contact you, where can they find you? Um, I've got my powders training. I'm down in Cornwall down there. Um, If anybody wants to contact me via that, that's absolutely fine. That's a website they can get hold of me on, email addresses on there um, and everything. Um, I know that some people read some of my stuff in Gundog Journal, Um, the stuff I my witterings in there. But the easiest thing to do is just contact me through the business website, my powders training. A big thank you to Michelle for a fantastic podcast. We hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it. And I look forward to speaking to you all next week. 